data is a key technology of the future. However, what is big data? When we think about big data, we might think about location data of mobiles, of autonomous cars. We might think about health data that stems from our smart watches. We might think about contact data, the people we write emails to or the data about people we talk to. It could be social media data, it could be data from monitoring systems, from environmental monitoring systems, but also financial markets. The big data is often linked to machine learning and artificial intelligence because these algorithms are trained based on big data. And on the other hand, they are the only ones that can process big data. And this is the moment where societal concerns come in. Do we still know what data is harvested about our behavior, about the things we do? And what kind of insights might big data provide that we're not even aware of? It also has some important meaning in the context of the COVID-19 outbreak. Governments all around the globe hope that big data might provide insights about this pandemic. Today, I will talk to Victor Meyer Schönberger. He's professor of internet governance and regulation at Oxford University. He's a renowned expert and public speaker on big data. He published several award-winning books and he serves as a member of the German Digital Council and advises Angela Merkel on societal and economic impacts of big data and digitalization. Thank you very much for taking the time. Mr. Mayer Schönberger, you were born and raised in Austria and you have lived now for many years in the UK. How is the situation in the UK? How did the COVID-19 crisis change public and personal life? Life has come to a stop, uh, albeit uh, somewhat later than in Austria, uh, due to the reluctance of the current British government uh, to uh, bring about a, a halt, essentially, uh, of economic and social life. Uh, and only when the uh, tremendous consequences of the pandemic became obvious, particularly when we heard and saw the uh, terrible situation uh, unraveling itself in Italy. Uh, the British government uh, realized that this was uh, not something to try untried strategies like herd immunity, but this required really uh, a very prudent lockdown very quickly. In the context of the UK outbreak, is data privacy discussed? There is, but but it's much more muted because there are other more pressing issues. Just to give you a comparison, um, Germany has about 25,000, roughly speaking, ICU units, uh, in, uh, intensive care units. Uh, Austria has a couple of thousand, about a tenth of, of the German number. Um, let's say 2,500, um, and uh, the UK has 2,500 too. And what the UK does, you know, is very, very little testing uh, because um, they register a COVID-19 death only uh, when it happens in a hospital and the person has been tested positive in COVID-19, uh, but many, many people die outside of the hospital, or many, many people die never to being tested uh, for COVID-19. So there is a, a drastic underreporting in the number of deaths, and there is a, a equally drastic underreporting in the number of infected people. So with all this happening, privacy is not on the front burner. And what kind of measures could be based on big data? When we think about um, uh, taking back some of the lock uh, uh, down uh, uh, rules, the, the central idea is that if we take them back and people start interacting again, we will have new infections. There is no question. The real task for, for public policy is to keep the number of infections in check, not to reduce them to zero, but to keep them in check so that they don't overextend our healthcare system. So if we have 10,000 new infections a day, that clearly extends uh, our stretches, our healthcare systems beyond its breaking point. But if we have 10 or if we have 100 a day, it doesn't. Uh, and, and that's the, the very small path that public uh, policy now needs to, to follow. And nobody knows how to do that. But just to give you one sense about how difficult that is, uh, the Robert Koch Institute in Germany has um, conceded 
that with their manual capacity and all of the ability that they have, they can keep track of about 200 infections a day. And that is where big data and that is where um, a more automatized track and trace comes in. If we could have um, a way by which we could track and trace um, in a responsible and privacy enhancing way, but still ensure uh, that that people who have been endangered could be informed, um, uh, then uh, we could live a somewhat more normal life. What would be the databases of this tracking and tracing? The bracelets have been discussed. In fact, Liechtenstein has put forward a rather controversial plan of a required bracelet that would measure the person's temperature um, and continuously re relate that information uh, to health authorities. Uh, that's a rather invasive kind of, of way of doing it. Um, an, an obvious alternative is, of course, the smartphone and there to use Bluetooth technology. Now, Bluetooth technology is not perfect by any measure, but it's a, a probably um, a suitable proxy that we have. What will be tracked and traced? Contacts and location data. Anything else? No location data, actually. Um, so the PEP-PT standard, that's the emerging European standard uh, for doing this, tries to do without location data, but just looks at, at, um, at basically a list of other smartphones that my smartphones has been in the proximity of. And uh, therefore, uh, just has uh, basically ID numbers. Uh, and only when um, one of us is being infected um, and, and, and has been confirmed, those in my list of IDs that I potentially could have infected can then be informed. In other words, that this is used to inform people that they have been exposed and that they need to be very careful now, should get tested or should self-quarantine or whatever um, is the, the, the right protocol and the right um, approach to that. And we may uh, also think about some process where not individual data, but sort of aggregate data of all Austria or so forth is somehow generated that the public health authorities know that what is the total number of people in, in Austria that are that, that have currently potentially been infected or so uh, in order to understand what the size of the problem is. It would be wrong, fundamentally wrong, I think, if we were to link um, the, uh, the outcome of that app um, or that process in the app to um, our ability to participate in society, whether it's to go into public spaces, public transport, um, uh, whether uh, it would reduce our ability to go to school or uh, these type of things. I think the population, the people out there um, like being taken as adults uh, and like being taken seriously. Uh, and when they uh, when they are taken seriously and when they are being trusted, they trust. And so it would be fundamentally wrong to put out an app that has built into it uh, a distrust. At the end of the day, if we look at our society, our society is pluralistic and democratic. Um, it's a liberal society and it's a society that uh, for the most part is built on rationality and built on facts. That all constrains, I think, um, the, the space in which potential COVID-19 apps can grow. What are big data-based technologies or digital technologies that might emerge during the next years that might help us to fight COVID-19 or any other virus in the future? There is very interesting little um, anecdotes. So there's a fever thermometer company in the United States that measures temperatures through digital thermometers uh, that are connected to an app on smartphones through Bluetooth, right? Um, and uh, you can enable through the app that the 
that the data is sent to a central server anonymized. Um, and what they have seen is in real time, thanks to the fever data of hundreds of thousands of thermometers out in the United States, literally a million thermometers out in the United States, where the hotspots were. You know, you couldn't drill down to the street, but you can drill down to the city or the metropolitan area or a county. Uh, and that helps, of course, public health officials greatly in allocating scarce public health resources. Um, you know, foreseeing perhaps were uh, in a week from now, uh, more intensive care units or ventilators will be needed. But the biggest impact, I think, the far by far the biggest impact of big data we will see in the development of drugs and vaccines. What kind of big data will then be used for the development of drugs and vaccines? I think there's three ways to look at it. One is basic gene sequencing and these type of uh, technologies that are, when you look more closely at it, the so-called shotgun approach of gene sequencing is based on basically pattern matching and pattern recognition and putting sequences, little snippets of sequences together. Um, and the fact is that we were extremely fast. Humanity was extremely fast in sequencing uh, the SARS-CoV-19 uh, virus uh, RNA. Uh, that RNA was sequenced by mid-February and only possible through big data and, and, and some machine learning uh, capabilities. The other thing is that we will use machine learning far more uh, in the future and big data to find the needle in the haystack of um, medical literature. Every week there is about, if I recall the number correctly, 10,000 new medical journal articles coming out. Nobody can ever read that. Um, sifting through and, 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 and finding suitable ones as a sort of smart filter um, is, is certainly uh, going to help. And then there is, on a third level, the, the shotgun approach of um, uh, finding um, medical treatment. You know, we have databases of tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of um, chemical components. If that's possible, then we can use the entire database of components in order to quickly reduce the number of components that we need to look at with greater detail. Is big data also big business? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, it's big business. And, and when we look at what's happening right now with home office work, with distance learning, um, we are basically using the platforms and the apps um, of the uh, of the large incumbent players, and when we think about uh, taking all of the data of this pandemic and putting it together, uh, where would we do the analysis? We are doing it on Amazon Cloud Service or on Microsoft's Azure, um, and so forth. So, if if there is one collateral effect of the pandemic, um, it is that we are pushed further down the digital route, but also further into the laps uh, of the digital superstar. Is now this kind of big, big data also a public issue? So should it remain with private companies or should this be part of a public big data set? I don't think that the, it's the task of the government to run uh, data centers. Um, but I do think that it is very important for the government to think where public health data resides in a cloud. Does it need to, you know, can it, does it need to reside on a server in Europe? Does it need to be fully encrypted? Uh, does it need to have to sit on service layers um, that are coded? by and run by European companies. We're talking about digital sovereignty here. And I very strongly believe that we should at, at the best, to the best possible extent, use tools that are the best fit for the problem, wherever they come from. But there are certain areas I where I think we need to look more closely. 
and public health data is just one of those. Does big data bring any kind of new social responsibility for the major companies working in this area? So is big data a new kind of big CSR? I think so, and it's hard. Take the, the current um, debate in Austria about the Red Cross app that has been designed by Accenture. Um, and so I'm in a way, there is a big backlash against Accenture for having designed an app that, if I recall correctly, a large insurance company in Austria paid for uh, in order for the Red Cross to then make it available. Companies like Accenture basically make money from selling their expertise uh, and selling their consulting services. That's their business. So if they now understand how to do a track and trace app uh, because they have done it in Austria, of course, they will go to other governments around Europe and offer their services because that's what their business model is. Um, and it would be too much to ask them you know, to do it for free. But I think it is not too much to ask them to use uh, European-wide interoperable standards. And it's not too much to ask them to include in their efforts and to embrace um, other parties like um, university researchers, uh, NGOs that care about privacy and so forth, and to make this a more inclusive process that will slow down the development cycle, of course, but that will also make it more inclusive. And we are harking back to a, a, a theme or a topic at the early stages of our interview when I talked about the need for trust. Um, and the more inclusive such a process of designing such big data applications is, uh, the more trustworthy they also tend to be, particularly in these trying times. What kind of driving forces do you see for the future of responsible innovation? There is a lot of talk about um, the need to have uh, more privacy uh, designed into the tools. And I have done privacy for 25 years now. I don't think it is privacy that will be a key differentiator or a key point in the future. There is a lot of talk about ethics in AI. I don't think it is ethics in AI. There's a lot of talk about transparency. I myself fell into that trap um, by asking, by, by um, suggesting that we should make algorithms transparent. I don't think that's it. Um, I think that what we need is a very um, clear and hard-nosed risk management or risk-based um, approach. Um, and to be very clear about the risks involved and the probabilities uh, involved. Um, much like you know, when we look at cars, individual cars, we haven't prohibited car traffic. Um, that would reduce the risk of accidents to zero, uh, but we haven't done that. Uh, we accept a certain risk uh, in car traffic, uh, but at the same time, we try to mitigate that risk as much as possible. So driving as licenses, through uh, roadworthiness of cars, through car testing when they are being manufactured, and on and on and on. And I, I think it's this ecosystem of sort of risk management that we need in the digital realm as well. We don't have that at all right now. So we need, I think, uh, to move into a risk-based normal. Mr. Mayor Schönberger, thank you very much for this very interesting interview and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.